It's an Englishman in the Balkans podcast. Today is April the 4th. Uh, we're in to spring, definitely. I'm looking out of my studio window at the moment. We have my favourite all-time blue skies. And I think at the moment outside it's 19, 20 degrees. It will go up to 23 degrees. Absolutely mental. But for an Englishman, uh, I just love it. Coming from a country where it's just rain and mist and fog and miserableness all the time. On today's episode, I'm joined by somebody that I've met a few times in the past. I think the first time I met her, that's giving it away, it is a lady. We were cooking together, if I remember correctly. And then we bumped into each other on the streets. Now, I've mentioned this person before to friends of mine. And when I've said where she comes from, they have gone, what? So we're going to find out about... A special person, there are quite a few special people now in Banja and in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So here's another one to join the club. It's Ariana. Now, I'm not going to ask Ariana who she is because here's my all time first question. Some people find it uncomfortable, so I hope she won't. Ariana, who are you? Who am I? I am a Latin woman living in Banja <laughs> I am Mariana. I am 30 years old currently, and I came to Banja Luka for, I cannot say I came for love because actually I'm the one who dragged my husband here. <laughs> so it's not that I came here because he wanted to come here. I was the one who said, we're going to Banja Luka and we're going to live there. How long ago did you make that decision? And why did you make that decision to drag your husband here so we've been living here for three years now i am from caracas venezuela and we met on a cruise ship we were working together there and he worked for 12 years on cruise ship i worked for three and after my third year i'm like i want a home you know i i want a place where to leave my luggage because when i joined ships i'm just traveling like when you disembark when you finish your contract, you're supposed to go home. But things were going on in Venezuela and I didn't want to go there. So I just asked the company to send me to Spain where I have family. So I would stay there for one or two months and then go back on board. But I didn't have a home, really. My home was mostly the ship. And at some point I told Sarjan, like, I really want a place where I can leave my stuff and and nevertheless, I was tired of cruise, uh, yeah, ship life, actually, that's what we call it. And that's when we dis I decided <laughs> to move to Banja Luka, and he was like, well, if that's your choice, let's do it. So there are the two of you on a cruise ship, which I think some people think is an exceedingly glamorous lifestyle, but maybe not so. What was it like, you know, I mean, most people, when they meet, they bump into each other on a coffee bar or a you know, a friend's party or whatever. That sounds like it was a completely different situation from you, you know, rolling from left to right, hang on, port to starboard on a ship. So that must have been a very unusual first meeting. Ship life is a completely different lifestyle, I do have to admit. We live in a fantasy, especially depending on the job title you have. And I was very lucky because I had a good position on board and I had a lot of privileges as well as Serjan. So in our job positions, we didn't have to cook. We didn't have to clean the dishes. We didn't have to do our laundry. So we had people to do that for us. So yeah, it was actually amazing to live like that for three years and for him 12. So it was, it was yeah, fantasy life. It wasn't real life. We didn't have to pay bills. You know, we, we will just get our salaries and travel and enjoy life, you know? Personally, I didn't have to send money home. There's a lot of people who work, who work there because they have families on land, so they send money home. I didn't have to do that. So all the money was in my pack, in my pocket, and, and that's it. And how we met, it was just like, I, I literally saw him from a distance, and I said, I want him. I want to meet him. This guy is for me. <laughs> and we met. And he's mine. <laughs> You've met Surgeon. You're getting on together. 
when he was telling you about where he came from, Bosnia and Herzegovina, which I have to admit, if you mention the country to most people in the world, they don't even know where it is. When he was telling you about the, the country, what sort of picture were you painting in your mind? And has that picture become your reality now? Well, first of all, it was funny because on cruise ships, we have a name tag with our country. And first of all, his name is the first time in my life I read his name and his last name. And like, there's so many letters and no vocal. And it's, <laughs> it's his name. And then on the country, it said Yugoslavia. And that when I was like, but I thought that country didn't exist anymore. Like last time I studied in school, they told me that country. And he's like, yeah, yeah. It's just that I asked to be Yugoslavia, but I'm from Bosnia. And I'm like, mm. he's like, do you know where that is? And I'm like, no idea. I have no idea. I'm sorry. I sound so dumb, but that is the truth. That's what happened. And then he asked me, do you know all Serbia or Croatia? And I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I know they're in Europe. He's like, well, yeah, Bosnia is around there. Like, okay. And then he asked me, do you want to come to Bosnia? And I was like, yeah, sure. And we were like two months together. And then I came for the first time on vacation to visit him and be with him. What was it like? I mean... I've had people that have visited me as guests and said once they'd seen the country and everything, they opened up and relaxed. But the first, how could I say, the first reaction was, where have I come to? Was it the same for you? I was pleasantly surprised because he told me about what happened here and, you know, he mostly told me the reality, so to speak. But... Because I came as a tourist, I saw everything so pretty and so safe. For me, the first thing was how safe I felt and how careless people walk on the street. And they, they're not looking back. They're not aware of leaving stuff in their cars. Like they leave their purses or whatever and nothing happened. And that's what caught my attention primarily. And so when we decided to come here, I told him that that's why I wanted to come here. That's the, the main reason why we're here. I did have a shock in reality. Actually, I've been here for three years. And just last weekend, I said, where am I? To be honest. But the rest of the time, I practically live in a bubble because I have my own home. We have a gigantic garden. I have a lot of foreign friends. And even though I do, I cannot say I speak the language, but I can communicate. And when I go out, I go out by myself to supermarket or stores or whatever, and I can communicate. People are wonderful. And as I said, I feel very safe, especially as a woman walking at night. I, I don't have that fear of someone following me or screaming stuff at me, like cat calling or stuff like that. So I really like that. I mean, obviously it's not my home country, and I've been in other places and I mean, nowhere is perfect, I would say. There's some stuff that can improve, but some stuff I would never change. You married, Surgeon, and you are now like, like I am. You're, you're part of a family here. And that takes the whole tourist approach into a completely new dimension. Completely, especially with the cultural aspects. Latin America and the Western Balkans are like not only geographical on either side of the world, the approach to life is completely different. How did you cope with those changes? Or maybe you haven't. Yeah, I think that I, I haven't. Um, as I said, I live in a bubble and I still keep my customs, so to speak. I, I haven't adapted. I mean, not, not adapted. I haven't adopted many of their cultural traditions or whatever i do feel like because i said like okay living there i don't want to change who i am you know like i respect the tradition their traditions and i've been immersed in their culture obviously but i'm still myself one silly example is using shoes inside the house i don't know if you do that and where you come from do you take off your shoes when you enter your home for me it was a cultural shock so at my home 
I didn't ask people to take off their shoes. I actually asked them to keep them on. And then they get shocked and they get not insulted, obviously, but they get uncomfortable because it's not normal for them to walk in with shoes. But obviously, when I go to someone else's house, I automatically take off my shoes. But this is just a small example of, you know, different cultures and traditions. With living here, there are so many different things. As you're saying, there's linguistics to cope with. I think I'm a little bit like you, actually. I'm able to go out on my own. My restaurant Serbsky is like really, really good. Um, I can do politics, but I need a few glasses of rakia. <laughs> but there are so many things to cope with. For me as an older person, my excuse is that my brain is not working so hard. But it's taken me some time to to get used to culture. Uh, I was talking to a lady the other day and she laughed so much when I said it's like a game of snakes and ladders. Every time you get to the top of the ladder and think you've cracked it, it's down at the bottom. Is it an enjoyable experience having seen and, and been exposed to all these new things? Because I can only assume uh, that... Venezuela and Bosnia Herzegovina, you know, it, it's different in so many aspects. Yeah, I wouldn't say we're even similar, to be honest. There's so many differences, good differences. I really, I, I think, for example, people ask me if I miss my country, and I don't, <laughs> to be honest. I wouldn't go back. I, I would rather stay here, for example. Um, but yeah, language is a barrier. I think it's mostly because I am too comfortable. I speak other languages and my excuse, you said that your excuse is that you're old, but my excuse is that my brain is full with other languages. So there's no more space for any more languages. <laughs> it's a silly excuse, just me not wanting to pay attention or whatever, but my restaurant serves me also <laughs> amazing. Oh, not. Talking about restaurants, um, I've found uh, that I have adapted very well uh, to local cuisine. In fact, uh, there's, apart from a few things, I don't even miss um, what is traditionally British for me. There are a few things, of course, but in the main, I'm, I'm much more of a Balkan eater. Um, my home country is not known in the world as being up in the top 10 of best countries for food. I mean, we're nothing like the French or the Italians or anybody else. Um, but I think, you know, Latin America is up there as well. So how do you find coping with the the culinary differences um, between what you were used to and what you have now? I do love local food. I, I actually enjoy it. I think this is not a place for vegetarians, I have to admit. Uh, <laughs> everywhere you go, they just have meat. And then if they offer a vegetarian, have you ever ordered a vegetarian dish here? Um, there used to be a vegetarian restaurant actually in Banja Luka. It didn't last very long, but no, no. I mean, I don't look at, at a salad as a vegetarian yeah. dish, right? Sometimes I just like to have a, a salad, but you have to admit, besmeso without meat, I mean, it's not a meal, <laughs> is it? It's just tea. And that's, that's if you eat teas, because then vegan is another story, like... Uh, it's, I'm just saying that it's difficult for people who want to follow that specific diet. It's difficult to find something here that you can eat because of how they cook. I'm not complaining. I love meat, so it's not a problem for me. But the other day I ordered, um, actually, yeah, sometimes I'm just craving chavasi or pleskovica with, with one of my favorite dishes. So we ordered chavasi and then I also ordered uh, mushrooms which I love. Then it turns out that the mushrooms come inside the bread where they also serve chiwafi. So I think that that's actually like a vegetarian dish. So it's like the bread. Oh my God, I forgot the name. Do you remember the name? Yeah. Lepinia. Yeah, that. The lepinia full of mushrooms. And that was the dish. <laughs> it's just, this is hilarious. This is like almost a vegetarian dish, you know? But I just wanted the mushrooms. I don't need the bread. But yeah, the local cuisine is amazing. My parents came for my wedding and they were very pleased with the food. They really, really loved it. They said that everywhere they ate, um, the food was amazing. I do love to cook. I actually have uh, another, I have like three Instagram accounts. Uh, one of them is Simple Kitchen where I cook and I post my recipes there. 
And uh, I just love cooking. So yes, I go out and eat out, but I also enjoy my meals. So what I do is that those dishes that I miss from back home, I just make them here. Even though sometimes it's difficult to find certain ingredients that I actually have to bring from abroad. But I mean, I, I still enjoy local food here very much. Because you cook at home and you, as you say, you're cooking Venezuelan dishes, um, how does Surgeon actually, does he, does he like your home food better than what he gets from outside? I mean, he's not here, so we don't have to put him on the spot. <laughs> he absolutely loves it. I do have to admit that, and I'm not exaggerating, like he literally would take photos of the dish, the dish that I made and he would send it to his friends like, look what my wife he made for me. So he, he's so happy that I, I love cooking. And actually, when we met on the ship, I never had that that experience or that space to cook because as I said, we don't have kitchens for us to cook on the ship. So it was actually a pleasantly surprise for him that after we started living together, I had the opportunity to show my cooking skills and he was like so happy. And yeah, I, there's there's a typical dish called arepa. This is the Venezuelan dish. And this is his favorite dish ever. He knows how to make it, but sometimes he would be like, can we have arepas for breakfast? Like he, he even craves these dishes. So obviously that's also great. I checked online a little bit earlier about Venezuela because I knew nothing about it. But there are some beautiful parts of your country. They're, they're absolutely gorgeous. And Bosnia as well, I think, is for me one of the most beautifulest country, countries in the world. Um, how much of the country have you seen and what is your favourite place in Bosnia-Herzegovina that you would recommend to anyone if they just had enough time to go and see one place, what would it be? Um, I have to admit that if you come to Bosnia, you should come to Banja Luka. I think it's not a well-known city. Everyone goes to Sarajevo or Mostar or maybe Neum, where the piece of sea is. But Banja Luka is such a beautiful city. And I think it's underrated. And people should come and see it. And because there's no much information about it for example again when my family came my uncles from spain came my grandma they were so surprised they were, because they didn't know anything about it either so they were like i wasn't expecting this like they they were so surprised pleasantly surprised they even want to come back and and stay longer to explore a little bit more of the city so come to banya Luka and and just walk around the city center there's this beautiful church that's where i got married the church in the center, um, and try the food, the local food. Banyan, I think it's a very, very good place to visit. I would agree with you. What was a marriage like then, being a Venezuelan? Um, I don't think there's many Orthodox Christians in Venezuela. I might have that wrong, but I don't think so. Um, that, and I've seen a wedding or two here, uh, and I, I'm always blown away uh, by the detail and the tradition that goes into it. Um, but luckily, from me, I've never done it. Tamara and I got married in, a, in, in the municipal offices. That must have been the culture shock of culture shocks. <laughs> and I had to admit, I thought it was going to be <laughs> too much. But sometimes family and friends are, how can I say this, different. <laughs> Let's put it like that. They're different. So there are a lot of traditional things that, they didn't do, thankfully, because there's some stuff that I really don't agree with. There are other things that I thought that they were cute, but they didn't follow. And it would, I, I have to admit that it was more of a shock for the local at our party, how we partied, how, because the, the deal was to get married in the Orthodox Church. I'm Catholic, I'm, I'm Catholic, he's Orthodox. And the deal was like, okay, we're going to get married in Orthodox Church, but the party is going to be a matching party. So it was great for both worlds because my family and, and friends from other countries came too, and they experienced this Orthodox man, which is absolutely beautiful. My wedding was the first wedding I ever been. <laughs> Oh, it was also new for me. I didn't know what to do. The feast, what well, they call it, pop here. 
And the pop was great. He was, he was, he even said bienvenidos when he started, like in Spanish. That was so cute. And then sometimes he would translate in English so I would understand what was happening. Um, and it was great that the, um, the whole uh, ceremony was awesome. And, and my family was so happy to be part of it. And I was just waiting for that crown to be on top of my head. And when they wrap your hands with this fabric and you walk around, like these are things that we obviously don't have in the Catholic weddings. And they were so cute, so meaningful. But on top of that, I did my research and I wanted to know what they meant because I asked around and nobody knew what was the crown for or what was the three last around were for. So they didn't know. I had to Google it because nobody knew how to explain the meaning of this traditions and this ritual. But it was just, I'm actually very happy we got buried in the Orthodox Church. It was also very important for him, obviously. But then the Latin party was like another thing. My friends and I were all night dancing. And, and I think that Balkans think they know how to party. But they, when they meet Latina then they, and they saw this party, they were absolutely like they, they talked about it for months and they shared the photos and stuff because they were just such a different wedding and party what was the highlight of the party what what is the big thing um that you do in in latin america that when it comes to a wedding you know uh yeah the, yeah the wedding party. so we have something called ora noca it's a crazy hour so at this time everyone is already drunk i don't know if i can say that in your book <laughs> Of course you can, of course you can. <laughs> so by the way, I asked my parents to bring rum from Venezuela. This is a very traditional, typical rum in Venezuela. It's called Santa Teresa. And I said, like, come on, there are already things like food and stuff that I cannot have in my way. So at least I want to have this typical rum. So they brought the rum. I bought these things online, like Amazon and Anibaba. So for Oranoka, we wear like masks. And, and we put on some custom and it's more like a carnival party. So everyone is wearing hats and crazy glasses and, you know, crowns with lights and stuff. And then we put music that you have to dance. Like we put, I don't know, the Macarena or La Bamba, like these, these obvious songs that have choreographies and you know them and you just join. And, you know, everyone is dressed up and the bride and groom usually have like the biggest hats. Um, yes. And that was the part that absolutely no one was expecting, obviously. Like, suddenly you see someone walking with a pink wig and we're in the middle of, my, of you know, like of a wedding party. And then everyone started looking for them. Like, everyone ran to my mom, who was the one who had all these props. And they were like, I want one, I want So I was happy about it because I thought, like, maybe they're not going to accept it. Maybe they're going to thought that it's weird, that they're going to think it's weird. But no, they were actually so hyped to, to dress up as well. So photos and videos are obviously amazing. And, and that is something that they never lived before. And that is the highlight of the party. I like this. I think this cross-cultural, um, these cross-cultural experiences benefit both. And as, as you say, your, your parents want to come back already. Yeah. Ariana, one of the things I want to talk to you about is that not only have you jumped this, uh, made this big leap, in, into coming to to Southeast Europe, to, to the Western Balkans. Um, and you said about uh, the linguistic challenges that there are. I know that you, you do speak more, uh, more than just English and Spanish. Uh, I do English and German, so thank goodness I'm one of the few Brits that is a bit bilingual. Um, but you've decided to do something completely new and innovative by offering... Uh, a service to help people learn English. Can you tell me a, as much as you can about that? Because I I've seen it online. I haven't really got an idea. <laughs> okay, so this is called Get Chatty, and it's for people who already speak English, but they need someone to practice it with. Because this is not a course for beginners. So this is like it happens to me. For example, I do speak other languages, but I don't have I don't practice them daily. So then when it's time for me to use the language, then I forget the words or some grammar rules. 
So that what Get Chatty is about is for people who already know the language, but they need to improve their vocabulary and their grammar. So this worked via WhatsApp. So I just I created an Instagram account where you can, uh, you know, also learn there because I post every day. I post uh, test English tests so people can also practice there. But the main activities are on WhatsApp. So it's practically live because I'm the teacher, so I'm the one who sends the activities and voice notes. Everything is via voice notes. So students answer back with voice notes, and then I correct them. I correct their pronunciation, their grammar. Um, we have conversations. Like activities are there to bring a topic. And then they answer the activity, but then we continue the day with with a conversation like we're doing now, for example, you and I, and it's just so entertaining for them. Also for me, because I love my job. Um, but then the, the main point of this is for students to get more confident when speaking English, because maybe they're shy. Maybe they think that they do not, don't know the language, or maybe they think that they know a lot. And then when it's time for them to express their, themselves, then they find like, oh, no, I don't know this word or I don't know this grammar. So it, it is different because it's by voice note. And it's like you can answer and you can send a voice note whenever you can, even if it's at three in the morning that you have time to send me a voice note, I will answer the next day and continue with the conversation. And it's daily. That's the other thing because other students offer like three times a week. I don't think that's enough. So classes are from Monday to Friday. It must be a real drain uh, on you to do all this, un unless, I don't know, are you on your own? Do you have uh, uh, other people to help you? Because, you know, doing this, even though they're, they're short voice notes or even long voice notes, that's a lot of time out of your day to, um, to run this business. Yeah, I started it with a friend, actually. We started it together. I was afraid of doing it by myself, to be honest. And she's the one who pushed me. She was like, I will do it with you. Let's start it. And, and we were, we worked together for a long time, developing the activities, the logo, Instagram, whatever. But then it came to a point where we just parted ways and I stayed with the company and yeah, I'm alone now, but I, I enjoy it. I have the time. This is my only job, <laughs> my only income. So this is what I do. So I have my day and my time to dedicate to get chatty. And it's not that bad, you know, <laughs> I really, I really think that, um, yeah, it consumes my day, but it's my, it's my job. And then I just use my phone so I can literally go out and, I don't know, go shopping or whatever. And I just have my phone and answer my students. Have you got a plan where you're going to have more people and, and maybe even go to another language possibly? Yeah, I, well, that's my dream to have so many students that I have to hire someone else. Um, right now, I'm like comfortable with the number of students I have and it's manageable. But yeah, I want to keep promoting. Um, everything is in promotion and marketing. I have to do, to boost that up and get more students. And when it, when there's a point that I can't do it anymore, then I'll hire someone else. And then, yeah, the point, like my dream is for me to be just the owner and then have teachers working on it with, with, with the students. For now, it's me and uh, other languages. I mean, a lot of people are asking for Spanish, but I have to be honest, dude. I don't know how to teach Spanish. So the dream is, the dream is, if you if you could if you could expand, you would. But at the at the moment, it seems like you've got the perfect life. You've got a lovely place to live. You've got a husband that adores you, and you adore him. And now you've got a, a business. I mean, this this really is for you, Ariana, living the dream. I I would say. Well, funny you say that. Um, not, life is not perfect. We all have um, bumps in our way. Uh, I, I actually want to mention this because maybe you have some listeners out there. And when I went through what I'm going through, it helped me a lot to listen to other people's stories. And uh, I felt better. So I, I, I'm going to put it out there. I'm... I had two miscarriages, actually. The last one was this weekend. I had a miscarriage, second one. And 
it doesn't seem like I have a perfect life right now, you know? That, that's something that Sardin and I really want. We want to have babies and, and we're having this physical problem that we still don't know what it is. And again, I'm just saying this because the, the first time it happened, I, I used my Instagram account to tell my story. And it was unbelievable how many women came and said, like, that also happened to me. And I'm there, and like, I know how you feel, but don't worry, I already have two, three, four babies. And that really helped me and made me feel better. And it made me move on with my life and continue and try again. And then sadly, it happened again. And I was still not ready to share it on my Instagram account. I'm taking this opportunity because you said that. You said you have everything right now and your life is perfect. And, and it's not. It's really not. Especially like today, I don't feel like it, it is. And that's why I'm saying this. Um, not everyone is, not everything is like it seems. Especially in social media, that it's going crazy. Social media right now, people are showing their perfect lives, and you really don't know what's going on in there. So that's why I'm taking this space to to tell my story too. You're very brave, and I'm not going to go into the TMI for me, but I I know exactly what you're going through, and yeah, it's you need to be very strong. But um, it does beg the question: um, the medical services here. Um, some people like back where I am in the United Kingdom think that it is a really backward place. I know it's still very raw. Um, you know, we're not far away from last weekend, but how have you found the medical support with something as emotional as this? Well, that's when I, that's the experience that I had that I said, where am I? Where, <laughs> where did I come to live? It was a very bad experience, I have to admit. I don't know if you have also had the opportunity to go to the, the hospital here and, and to seek medical treatment. I know that you're also going through something. So it, for me, it was like eye opening because this was the reason why we were not sure like to come to Bosnia, but I saw more positive things than negative. And then after three years is the first time that I have to go to a hospital and uh, I was shocked. Really, I was shocked with how I had to bring my own water, my own bottles of water, my own toilet, toilet paper. They asked me if I had my own ibuprofen. And like it, um, it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe that was happening. It's raw at the moment, as I say. Has it put you off being here? Yeah. I mean, I think it's also what I was going through and it was a lot of emotions and hormones obviously but I did I, I couldn't stop crying baby. like and I had to I had to go like on Friday and that's when I had the shock and then I had to go back on Sunday and stay one night and on Saturday I realized how bad it was and then at least on Sunday I went prepared with my own stuff but you, you shouldn't have, like, you shouldn't have to take your own toilet paper, paper to a hospital. <laughs> like, you shouldn't have to take your own ibuprofen to a hospital. I, I was shocked. And, and I was, yeah, of course, I started thinking, like, where should we go? Like, uh, I, I, I don't want to stay here. Like, that, this last weekend, I was just analyzing everything. But again, you have to put everything in a balance and... I have to be honest, I've been in many countries, in Germany, in Spain, in uh, France, and I don't feel as safe as I feel here. And and that's the day-to-day, -day because you don't go to the hospital every day, you know? But you do walk on the street and, and walk alone and walk with your dog every day. And I still feel safer here, and I still rather that than going to another country where I don't feel safe and then, oh, but they have an amazing hospital that I'm going to use once a year. I don't know what it's like to live uh, uh, back in Venezuela, but safety is such an important thing to you because you've mentioned it uh, so much. I, I think that, yeah, I, I feel safe here as well. Despite everything that's gone on, what what is your... It might be the wrong time to ask you this, but I'm going to ask you this anyway. Um, what's your plan, your immediate plans for the future? 
especially with Get Chatty. Yeah, so I want to keep, yes, I want to keep growing. I want to keep promoting Get Chatty and get more students. And as I said, uh, I mean, they had a goal for me. I don't think I'm going to reach it for me. <laughs> I wanted to have another teacher by May, but I don't think that's going to happen. But yeah, for this year, for example, my goals are to keep working with Get Chatty, um, get healthier, uh, hopefully, then get pregnant again. But um, yeah, I mean, my goals are not super high right now. I'm just focusing on now and what I have to solve now. <laughs> but yeah, we with Get Chatty for sure, I want to, I, I trust my product and a lot of people are impressed with it. My students love it. So I think I'm going through the right path. I'll leave um, the links that you give me, especially to uh, your Instagram, if you want that, and uh, also for Get Chatty. If somebody signs up for um, Get Chatty, how how soon do they actually get to take part in in, in what you yeah, offer? Yeah, so they can uh, send a message on my Instagram account, the uh, Get Chatty account, and I just I really answer right away because I'm checking my Instagram twenty four seven, and then they can start any Monday. They can start the course any Monday they want. Well, I hope that through listening and or watching uh, this podcast that, that people um, will be there to support you in more ways than hopefully you can imagine. Ariana, thank you very much indeed for giving me your time today um, to find out what it's like being another Stranatz, another foreigner living here, but um, more importantly, for being courageous enough to open up and you have my my support and my help for whatever I can do. 